20 years ago, I was at home, suffused with a big dream of the 2003 state election, and I got a phone call from New York. Don't scorn this, but it was from someone in News Corporation, ringing to congratulate me on the election result. But I seized the opportunity to talk to him about the invasion of Iraq that had started the day before. I've got to say, to my deep resentment, pushing off the front page of the Sunday papers, Labour's fabulous win in the New South Wales election. So the grievance I've got against the Bush administration to this day. I asked him what he thought the outcome of the war would be. And he said, well, he said, the White House believes that in defeating Saddam Hussein, there'd be a quick victory and there'd be an opportunity for America to intervene in other Arab dictatorships, even in Iran. He said, this will quickly remake the Middle East. The Middle East will be remade for market economies and democracies and peace with Israel. There will be an unimpeded flow of oil to Western markets. He said, the example of the remaking, the rebuilding of Iraq will be impossible for any other Arab state to resist. In that spirit, that invasion had taken place. The invasion was based on the same fateful focus that is directing American policy in Asia today, 20 years on. It's a focus on a word that Lawrence used, primacy. Or as Gareth Evans puts it, this is about the DLP words, dominance, leadership, primacy. America's goal is to see that no power can channel, can challenge its primacy in the world, and that was the spirit that drove the invasion of Iraq after America's win over the Soviet Union in the Cold War, a concentration of ultra-nationalists and neoconservatives formed a doctrine to guarantee that America could never be challenged, and any nation that sought to challenge it would be reduced to rubble. The focus was on entrenching, in the wake of its victory over the Soviet Union, American dominance, leadership, primacy. And that's what is the focus of US policy in Asia today, to respond to the challenge that China represents to American dominance, leadership, and primacy, and we are caught up in it. In 2017, I noticed the shift in what was being said by Prime Minister Turnbull and Foreign Minister Julie Bishop about China. There was a sudden shift in rhetoric, and I became curious in it. Some Chinese, I remember raised with me once, it was the then Chinese ambassador in fact, and said, what's, what's going on? Julie Bishop had given a speech saying China will never be great until it becomes a democracy. And speaking of Singapore, Malcolm Turnbull said we need an American military build-up in Asia. It was an unmistakable shift. And then it was backed by all sorts of things appearing in the media. I recall John Garner, who later became advisor on China policy to Malcolm Turnbull, saying that Chinese students in Australia were embodying ethno-nationalism. Because I was working in this area at UTS at the time, I committed to a research project. There were 130,000 Chinese students in our, in our university. There were only four incidents where it could be alleged students had pushed an argument in a classroom. I'm serious, there were four incidents in the end, four reports in the media of incidents where a Chinese student pushed back against a map that showed Taiwan as an independent country, for example. But the headline said, 
we're facing ethno-nationalism from Chinese students. It's a, it's a concrete example of what I branded China panic. For five years, now seven years, we had China panic with no evidence to justify, for example, a headline in the Telegraph the Chinese ownership of solar panels in western New South Wales gave them the power to unplug our electricity system. Or a story in the Sydney Morning Herald broken as an exclusive that the Chinese had plans for a base in Vanuatu. It took Prime Minister Turnbull standing at a Commonwealth summit next to the Prime Minister of Vanuatu to say this is not the case. Vanuatu is a member of the non-aligned movement. We had a four quarters program, among other things, that alleged that there had been serious Chinese espionage in the Australian public service. It quoted the case of a public servant who had secret material at his home in Canberra. Anyone watching that four quarters program in 2017 would have assumed serious assault on Canberra directed by Chinese security agencies. The public servant was taken to court. He's been issued with a $200 fine for having minor documents in his own. Something that Donald Trump and Joe Biden have found themselves responsible for in recent months. It was trivial. But if you watched four quarters, you'd have believed in part of a major Chinese espionage thrust. We produced a document at UTS called China Australia Talks China, replete with examples of stories loaded into our media with the help of security agencies to create the sense of a Chinese threat and sometimes, of course, Chinese behaviour fed this mistreatment of Uyghurs, for example, in Western China. But everything was subject to almost elaborate exaggeration, beat up hyperbole. One of our most experienced editors is someone called Max Such, the editor of the Financial Review, he edited the old National Times. He, he investigated this, this China panic in the media. He said that as an editor, he had witnessed many campaigns in the Australian media over the years. He had never witnessed any as professional as the China Panic Campaign unleashed in our media from 2017. Malcolm Turnbull. Malcolm Turnbull, of course, introduced foreign influence legislation. It's on the books, it's been on the books for five years. It hasn't produced a single example of Chinese foreign influence. But I could instance the US Study Center in Sydney, or ASPE, Australian Security Policy Institute, which receives funding from the State Department and American armaments countries, as pure examples of foreign influence seeking to shape Australian foreign policy that deserve the media administration. generously staffed foreign influence lobby, you can imagine operating in Australia today to see the Palestinian voice gets plotted out at every opportunity. <laughs> so the deliberate China panic in the media, where was it coming from? Who was driving it? Why were some journalists being favoured with a special link? Be at the home as you get bottle made at six in the morning tomorrow, and you can have an exclusive about a raid on the home and a member of the New South Wales Upper House. That was three years ago. She kept bottle made's political career was destroyed. Destroyed. Not a finding has been made against him. Anyone would have assumed as that story was packaged and massaged and presented exclusively to Nick McKenzie of the Sydney Point Herald and 60 Minutes that Chiquette Musselmane had lent himself to become an agent of Chinese influence, as if a whip in the New South Wales upper house was capable of knowing anything that would be of interest to Chinese agents taking an interest in Australia's geostrategic position. Absurd. 
I can get along. We brought these things to, we brought, when I was at UTS, we brought these things together in a publication. I think the clue to it lies in an article by someone who's now the director of the Office of National Intelligence, Andrew Shearer, who worked as foreign policy advisor to Tony Abbott and briefly for two. He wrote in this giveaway article, there are some people here in Washington who's working for an American think tank at the time, who think that Australia is still a very good ally, prepared to take the fight with America side by side in the Middle East. But Americans are beginning to doubt that Australia is such a strong ally in Asia. I think that was a seminally important article. And I believe that the biggest factor in this China panic, driving this consistent massage of Australian media, were people in Australian security agencies who believed their counterparts in Washington were disappointed and fearful that we might not go all the way with the US against China and wanted this corrected. Wanted this corrected. I believe without being remotely a conspiracy theorist that this is a large part of the journey this country has been on. The professor of industrial and international relations at Chicago University, John Mearsheim, or an advocate of American national interest as a guide to foreign policy. He said when he was in Australia a few years ago, I had the opportunity to meet him, I heard this from him directly, but he said the same thing publicly. He said, America will never allow its primacy to be challenged. We showed in World War I, defeating the Kaiser's Germany. We showed in World War II, defeating two rival empires. We've shown in defeating the Soviet Union that we will never allow dominance to be challenged. The alternative to friends is that there is room for multiple sovereignties on this planet. And that if there could be a just, if there could be a detente between Brezhnev Soviet Union invading Afghanistan supporting of the North Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia, presiding over an arms builder, a detente between Brezhnev Russia and America under Nixon, there could be detente between China under Xi and America under Biden or even Trump. <laughs> nothing, nothing could justify a war between these two. It can very easily become a nuclear exchange. Two sources for that. Hugh White's excellent sleepwalk to war spells out the circumstances in which one side or the other could decide to demonstrate its seriousness with a nuclear strike that would see the other side back down, fearing that if it responded with a nuclear exchange, there'd be a massive assault from the other taking out the cities. There's even a novel called 2034. The co-author is James Stravidas, an American admiral who was the supreme commander of NATO and commander of American battleship aircraft, battleship groups, making the point that a war between the two could degenerate into a nuclear exchange, imagining that a weak US president would think that early Chinese victories, sinking to aircraft carrier battle groups, could only be responded to with the detonation of an American tactical nuclear weapon over a Chinese city with a population of 10 million. No one believes, no expert believes the risk of a nuclear exchange here can be dismissed as trivial. We've got to assert something with the spirit of Southeast Asia, the nations of Southeast Asia believe themselves they can live in a world where power, a region, where power is shared between China and the United States, one balancing the other in a principle that has been known to underpin peace, avoidance of war in human history. If Singapore believes that it can deal 
with a strong China, as one of their former foreign ministers said very eloquently, then who are we to dash up to Singapore and say, you're wrong? The Singaporeans are anticipating a world in which power in the region is divided and in which they welcome the fact that Chinese power is offset by an American presence just over the horizon and vice versa. Indonesia has demonstrated the same instinct. The Philippines will fluctuate. Philippines nationalism finds an expression of anti-Chinese postures at the present time. That's what you can expect in a region of 10 nations, each finding its own way and having different attitudes at different times. But the region, there is no nation in Southeast Asia itching to join a showdown over Taiwan. And I conclude by underlining that the historic Australian position is that Taiwan would not trigger ANZUS. And that's what Alexander Downer gushed out in a burst of ill-advised truth-telling in 2004 when uh, Hamish MacDonald put to him in China, would the ANZUS Treaty apply in the event of a showdown between America and China in the Taiwan Straits? Alexander Downer said no. And indeed, he was speaking for a tradition in Australian diplomacy that goes back to Menzies, Prime Minister from 1949 to 1966. On two occasions, Menzies was invited by Washington to take a stand on Taiwan. One was Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, saying, we fear there might be a war over Chinese threats to the offshore islands. Menzies, Liberal Prime Minister, the longest serving Liberal Prime Minister, went to Washington and advised against it and said Australia would not be involved in it. When President Kennedy invited Australia to lead a community of nations that included Taiwan, Menzies, a liberal prime minister, said to the American president, nothing doing. We won't lead a new community of nations in Asia to support Taiwan. It was not going to be. When, when I asked foreign minister, said to the, the department, "Can you give me, can you give me a briefing date for my first visit to China?" What if I asked the Alexander Downer question? I got a very concise briefing note from DFAT. What What do you do if you're asked, "Would Australia be committed in a dispute over the Taiwan Strait?" DFAT recommended that the don't you minister say, that's a hypothetical question. <laughs> what if the leading persisted? Well, DFAT recommended that the, the robotic minister should say, the ANZUS Treaty is an obligation to insult. That was the official advice from Australian diplomats to me in May 2012 going to China. Why can't we return to that position. Why can't we say as an American ally, we're not going to be committed to an entirely unnecessary war over sovereignty in Taiwan? Let's reinstate the diplomatic status quo, the form of words that since 1972 enabled the people of Taiwan to fulfill their own aspiration, enabled China to have recognized or acknowledged its position that Taiwan was a province of China. Both sides happy. America settled on that formula. It was the Shanghai communique drafted by Kissinger. We need that wisdom back again. The war would be a horror for all of us, our country included. Thank you for gathering here.